Hi, welcome everyone. This is the IPFS All Hands Call for the 13th of January 2020. Happy New Year. It is the, it is the first call in, in this year. And I'm going to ask you to add your names to the meeting notes. The link I will post on the chat. And we have one agenda item, which is me talking about um, IPFS cluster and collaborative clusters and the, the clusters that we launched. But if you want to add additional agenda items, uh, you are welcome. But we have until we have 24 minutes more in this call. Shall we start? Okay. Um, Let's start by saying that we had a, a new cluster release, a new IPFS cluster release um, by the end of December. And this release adds um, a new um, binary, a new application called IPFS cluster follow. This application is made to make it very simple for anyone to join what we call a collaborative cluster. A collaborative cluster is an IPFS cluster, which allows random people to join that cluster and participate into pinning what that cluster is supposed to pin. So basically, it is a way to um, collaborate in backing up something that you will consider a useful archive with other users, which are potentially random, um, without having to trust those other users. The only people that you trust in this cluster are the cluster maintainers or the cluster publisher, of which you will have uh, essentially a list uh, of, of trusted peers. For those that don't know what a IPFS cluster is, it is an additional application, an additional daemon, which runs side by side to your Go IPFS node, and it will use the API, the local API offered by that, by that node to basically trigger actions like pinning and unpinning and a couple others. The interesting thing there is that all these cluster peers that run side by side with the IPFS peer will join a network, um, usually a private network, but as I say with collaborative clusters, uh, a parallel network that potentially anyone can join. And they will use that network to agree on a common state. And that common state is a shared pin set. It's a shared list of items that they are supposed to be pinning each on, on their own IPFS daemon. The result is that those items are not only the CID of the thing that they're supposed to pin, but they may also contain additional information. For example, um, Cluster pins have a names attached. They can have something like expiration uh, dates in which they will be automatically unpinned. And they have um, replication factors. Um, replication factors may not have too much sense in collaborative clusters because you, you cannot trust whether people are effectively pinning content or not. For that, we have Python, which runs great lengths into ensuring that people are storing what they're supposed to pin. But replication factors have a lot of sense when you're running uh, a cluster of peers that you actually control and you want to distribute um, how, how many of your peers should actually um, pin certain content. Um, along with this release, a few days later, uh, we launched something called collab um, ipfscluster.io. I'm going to paste it in the chat and I'm going to start sharing my screen in a minute. Let's see. OK. 
Can you tell me whether you are able to see the screen? I see yes. it. Yes. That's perfect. Thank you, Zoom, for not letting me down this time. Um, as you can see, Collab at DFS Cluster.io is a very simple website which has a list of clusters that we set up. And these are collaborative clusters, meaning we have launched a cluster. In this case, they have two trusted peers. So two peers which are able to modify the pin set in that cluster, two peers that we control. And for each of those clusters, we have added um, an archive, which is not too big and which we consider interesting. For example, the Filecoin params, which are necessary um, to launch the Filecoin, uh, the Lotus implementation on the test net uh, network. Um, we added some books in Spanish from the Gutenberg project, which has pretty much a very good selection of pretty much every book, which is free to, has no copyright or anything in the world. But of course, that's a very, a sizable archive. So I started adding the Spanish section of it. And also we have another cluster for IPFS websites, which means IPFS IO, the LIP2P website, the cluster website, uh, the docs website, um, and so on. And as you can see, the only necessary thing to join these clusters is to download the new IPFS cluster follow application, which is available in this IPFS IO along with Go IPFS and the other cluster applications and run in a single command, which is IPFS cluster follow, file going run and in a, and the init uh, URL. Uh, I'm gonna explain what this does particularly. Um, I can do that, for example, by showing you live on screen, which is essentially more interesting. So I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to share a terminal. Can you confirm that you see a terminal? Yeah. Can you make it a little bit bigger? Sure. The text size. How about now? A little better. <laughs> One notch bigger. That's the biggest I can go right now. <laughs> okay, it's great. This is Xterm, and this is defined as huge font size. So there's like no more options. Uh, just, just move closer to your screen. Just what? Yeah, well, okay, like this. Um, what else am I going to do? I'm going to download IPFS cluster follow from the beginning. So on a site window, I'm going to this IPFS IO and I am finding my system and downloading I'm extracting the latest version and now I can run it if I run it um, without any arguments, you will see that it says, I have configuration for two follower peers. This is one nice thing that IPFS cluster follow is that it allows you to actually run several cluster peers, several follower peers in parallel so that you can be tracking uh, several archives at the same time. And I can, for example, remove the the Gutenberg collection, for example, and we can initialize it from the beginning. Um, this folder. So 
if I run IPFS cluster follow now, it just tells me I have one. And the only thing I need to do now is to go to call up IPFS cluster.io and copy paste uh, the command. What this is going to do is to initialize my cluster peer, give it an identity. And after that, it is going to fetch a configuration from this cluster peer from Gutenberg ES uh, call up IPFS cluster.io. How does it fetch it? Uh, it is not actually fetching through HTTP, HTTP. This is configured as a DNS link, so it's going to resolve to an IPFS address. And it's going to use IPFS to actually fetch that configuration that will make my peer run with the optimal parameters. Well, optimal with the necessary parameters to connect to this cluster in particular. In order to connect to this cluster in, in particular, I will need a cluster secret and I will need the list of trusted peers for, for the cluster. And I will need the addresses of those peers so that I can, so that I can connect and I can bootstrap uh, to them. Let's try that. and successful request. Of course, because this is a live demo, it won't let me it won't let me do what I wanted to do but I can work around that. Uh, Hector, for the sake of the recording, could you explain just a little bit what happened and, you know, in two well, sentences? Yeah, sure. Uh, what happens is that I, it's trying to resolve um, the IPNS address. Which is uh, Gutenberg underscore es call up IPFS cluster that I hope. And it is saying it's basically not responding with what IPFS thinks is a valid string. And honestly, it's a message that I've never seen in my life. So, um, but I'm very quickly just going to find out what the actual IPFS hash for that configuration is. And that way we can directly bootstrap. Yeah, I don't think underscore is a valid DNS character. Huh. It, it, yeah, it, it should actually be a dash. But my problem is that this error is not complaining about that. Um, but thank you for noticing. Uh, in the meantime, I figure out the hash so I can actually bootstrap using the local gateway. With the hash. Ah, okay. Oh. What I'm going to do now is to reinitialize. Good. It seems I was more lucky then. Um, as we see in the blog messages, we initialized the peer. Um, and it just launched a cluster peer. It connected to, to the trusted peer set. And it is right now syncing all the pins in this archive. There should be around 400, I believe. 400 and something. 
Um, you can do this anytime. So peers can come and go anytime. If I if I stop the peer now, I could just restart it and I will catch up to the latest version of the archive. And if I send that to the background and I run IPFS cluster follow now, you see that I have IPFS cluster follow Gutenberg ES, which is again reconfigured. And if I if I call this command with that cluster name, it will I will be able to perform actions directly um, on that cluster. So for example, I can list all the pins which are listed on that cluster. Um, the screen is a bit narrow, but you see that it says the state pinned, the CID, and then it will list the, the pin name, which corresponds in this case to the name of the book that we are pinning. If I do an info command, I'm able to see information for this cluster here specifically, like where the configuration folder is, where the uh, configuration source URL is, and whether I am online. The funny thing, or the good thing here, is that I can actually stop the peer. All the errors that you see is because it didn't finish um, pinning on IPFS. It didn't finish going through that queue of 400 uh, items. But I can run info also when my follower peer is not running. And in that case, it will tell me that the cluster peer is not online, um, the IPFS peer is online though. And I can add, I also list the items in the archive um, while I'm off, off, offline. So I don't need to run my peer to know what items uh, that cluster peer is been in. And those are interesting things um, to do because you, yeah, you can basically inspect what the archive is about without having to relaunch your peer. As I say, you can stop and you can start, start your here again with, with the run command. It will go back, it will reconnect, it will actually keep track of other cluster peers in this cluster and try to reconnect to them and so on. And catch up to the latest version of the archive and start repinning again, going through the, going through the queues. Uh, peers that are not trusted, you will be able to connect to them. You the, the IPFS swarms will probably be connected directly, but those peers don't have access to, to making operations in the cluster or accessing information from your peer directly. For example, a, third, a, a peer that you do not trust is not able to know whether you are pinning something at a certain moment or trigger any operation in you or obtain any information other than your cluster peer ID and, and so on. So the, the trusted peers, however, they can, just like they can bin using your cluster peer, they can also potentially check whether you are pinning something or you had an error when pinning something or, or you finished. Um, at this point, I would like to open the room for, for questions. I'm gonna stop the, the screen share. And I'm sorry for the little problems that we had. I'm going to have to verify that error. Question from Peter. Uh, yes, Hector. Uh, could you clarify how do you uh, how do you mark a peer as trusted or untrusted? Is it a fully static configuration for now, or there is some smarts where the swarm can kind of propagate its uh, member list? Um, it is, it is a, a list of peers in the configuration. But the thing here is that since we use these remote configurations that you fetch, you fetch that configuration uh, every time you start. You don't fetch it only when you initialize. Therefore, the source can update the configuration and basically patch it, right? You, we can basically add new peers to that configuration and whenever the followers are restarted, they will pick up the changes. And uh, I guess this is why you use uh, IPNS so that you can update it asynchronously behind the scenes and exactly. the cluster so, will resolve it together. Yeah, so there is, we, we're using DNS link for that, yeah. So we, we update the DNS, but if we don't update the DNS, 
um, then you will essentially reserve to a CID that you already had locally in your IPFS daemon. So you don't have to, you don't even pay the price of, of going to some remote server to fetch your configuration. You're basically loading locally. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I'll ask one more. Uh, Hector, when you were uh, syncing things, it, uh, the info message was um, printing out CRDT uh, updated this, CRDT updated that. Uh, what do we use CRDTs for within Cluster itself? I am glad you ask. Um, the way that the cluster peers sync their state, sync their pin sets, to ensure that everyone has exactly the same vision is using CRDTs. So there is a distributed CRDT key value store. And it is actually a Merkle CRDT. It's a CRDT which is backed by IPFS blocks. Um, what we get from that is that you can sync the CRDT from any you can sync the the state from any of the participating peers by just fetching back. The bad thing there is that you're essentially building a blockchain. Therefore, it will tend to grow. Um, the more things you pin in the cluster, the low, longer this uh, chain will be. And there's where you need like, potentially you will need like more optimizations if you have many hundreds of thousand items pinned in the cluster. It may be it's lower for a new node that has to sync from the very beginning to actually fetch uh, all the parts or all, all the all the nodes. But there are there are some workarounds. Can you speak to how that works? Oh, sorry, Ali. No, no, go for it. Oh, uh, can you speak to how that works, uh, Hector? The the CRDT. I think that's kind of a common problem, right? Um, <coughs> wanting to uh, to have like a a tree that needs to be synced. Um, the fact is that Merkle, Merkle DAGs are essentially a structures that only grow. So just like blockchains, you always append at the root. Therefore, they are very similar to grow-only sets and grow-only sets, or they are essentially a grow-only set. It's just that you interpret it and traverse it in certain ways. Grow-only sets are a well-known CRDT. The characteristic of all CRDTs is, is that they are, they inflate. They, the states there usually don't get smaller. They inflate, at least for state-based CRDTs. For operation-based CRDTs, you need certain um, characteristics in your network that ensure operation delivery and so on. Um, for state-based CRDTs, you have things which basically inflate. And this is similar to a state-based CRDT, except it is synced um, more efficiently, taking advantage of basically IPFS and, and the fact that you only need to, to ship the new blocks around, not the whole thing every time. Anyone have more questions? Dirk does. <laughs> yeah, so one other question is, uh, what does it actually use to do the syncing? Is that using BitSwap or GraphSync or? BitSwap. Underneath, uh, this is a stack which is, it's IPFS Lite, so it's um, BitSwap plus DHT plus PubSub and so on. PubSub is used to, to propagate the new when you pin something, there will be a, a PubSub broadcast. And the new CID is broadcasted. And then every peer in the cluster will use BitSwap to copy the new blocks. It's essentially IPFS. It's essentially an application on top of all the IPFS things. Uh, you mentioned uh, the replication factor. Is it the case that? Uh, every single peer will have every single block 
or is there is it possible to run a collab cluster which shards a pin set? In the case of the pin set, everyone will have it. They need to have it because that that's the state. So in order to know if they yeah, have yeah, yeah. something, they need to. I meant the set of pins. I meant the have they pinned all the things? Now, how they pin all the things? In the case of of the collaborative clusters that they that we set up, everyone will every, everyone will pin everything. But as I say, you have you have the possibility of setting different replication factors per item. And what that will do is to choose the peers in your cluster which have most free space, as reported by IPFS. So there's a storage max configuration value in IPFS. So knowing how many how much of the repo storage we have used and what that configuration value is, we can uh, calculate how much IPFS free space you have. And it will rank them according to free space and I will, it will assign um, based on that. So if you say replication factor three, it will pick up three, three peers with, with the most free space and send the pins um, to those specifically. But as I say, if you're running in a untrusted open um, cluster, it would be very easy for someone to simulate that they're pinning something and they're actually not, or to simulate that they have infinite um, free space. So we're just saying now everyone pins everything and, and we don't do that selection. If you uh, moderately trust the peers in your cluster, then you can actually say, well, depending on how many peers you are and so on, you can start setting replication factors. Nice. Um, okay, we are at time. Uh, I see that no one added any new agenda items. So I am going to just thank you for coming to this call and for bearing through it. I'm sorry again that the things didn't work right away. Oh, it was great. Thanks, Hector. Sorry the demo guys didn't everyone. support you. Thank you. Uh, see you. Have a great time. Thank you. Take care.